Assalamu alaikum. My name is Mubeen Nas. I'm from MK Preparations. And today we're going to discuss about class Amphibia. We'll study about the general characteristics, classification, form, and function of the class Amphibia. And this topic is very much important uh, regarding to different competitive exams like Punjab Public Service Commission, PPSC Zoology, Federal Public Service Commission, FPSC Zoology, Blochistan Public Service Commission, BPSC Zoology, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, KPPSC Zoology, Sin Public Service Commission, SPSC Zoology. The material coded in these slides uh, has been taken from different source books, which includes FSC Biology Part 1 and Part 2, Federal Biology Part 1 and Part 2, Zoology Miller and Harley book, 5th and 10th edition, Hickman Zoology, Campbell Biology, and Rowan Biology. The material coded in these slides is very, very much important related to all the competitive exams. So you need to focus on every point and inshallah it would be helpful for all of you uh, for the preparation of different exams. And I have also coded some important NCQs at the end of this topic as well as I have added uh, past paper questions and that uh, are from the topic uh, class Amphibia from 2001 to 2022. All the amphibia related questions have been coded at the end of this topic. So the contents we're going to discuss about includes the general characteristics of amphibians, their evolution and phylogenetic relationship, classification, skin of amphibians, their support and movement, locomotion, nutrition and digestion, circulatory system, gas exchange, excretion and osmoregulation, nervous system and sensory functions, reproduction and development, and the important past paper questions of PPSC zoology. First of all, we'll study about the general characteristics of amphibians. Number one is skeleton. So the skeleton is mostly bony with varying numbers of the vertebrae. The skeleton of the um, amphibians is bony, okay? And it is made up of various numbers of the vertebrae. The ribs are present in some, but absent or fused to the vertebrae in others, like in a neurons, means in frogs or toads, there are no ribs. Body forms. Body forms vary greatly among the species, like the salamanders have distinct head, neck, trunk, and tail. As you can see in the diagram, salamanders have distinct head, neck, trunk, and tail. Adult frogs have a compressed body with fused head and trunk and no intervening neck. So the frogs have a compressed body, okay, with fused head and neck, as you can see in their diagram, and trunk. So all of these three parts of the frogs are uh, having connections with each other. Sicilians. Sicilians have an elongated trunk, as you can see here, the elongated trunk not strongly demarcated means it's not distinguished from the head and a terminal anus is also present. Now the limbs. So limbs uh, usually are quadrupedal means uh, uh, they have four limbs that are arranged in two pairs as you can see here in the diagram in case of salamanders. Okay. And the shoulder or the hip girdles are present. Some forms have a single pair of the limbs and others have no limbs like Sicilians. Sicilians have no limbs and some organisms have single pair of the limbs. Webbed feet are present as you can see. Webbed feet are present. No true nails. Four limbs with four digits. The four limbs have the four digits but sometimes five and sometimes fewer than five digits are present. Now the circulation. So heart uh, has a sinus venosus and two atria and one ventricle. They have double circulatory system. 
okay so through the heart in which the pulmonary arteries and the veins the pulmonary arteries are going to supply the deoxygenated blood to the lungs and after being oxygenated the oxygenated blood is going to return to the heart through the pulmonary veins okay and return the oxygenated blood to the heart the veins are going to return the oxygenated blood to the heart the the heart is abundantly supplied with the blood vessel now the skin so the skin of amphibians is smooth moist and glandular the skin is smooth it's moist moist due to the mucus gland secretions okay it's glandular uh, different types of glands are present their skin is modified for cutaneous respiration means there is uh, an exchange of the carbon dioxide and oxygen across the skin by the process of diffusion pigment cells means the chromatophores these are present in the skin of amphibians granular glands are associated these granular glands are associated with the secretions of the defensive compounds the granular glands are actually the poison granular glands they are going to release the poisonous secretions that are helpful for the amphibians for their defensive mechanism now the respiration so respiration is by the skin and in some forms it's by the gills or by the lungs okay so the frogs are going to respire through the skin directly the carbon dioxide is uh, diffused out and oxygen is uh, going to be diffused into the skin and across the lungs and in some cases across the gills so the larva of the aquatic amphibians the larva of the amphibians is usually aquatic it's going to spend its life in water so in case of water just like the fishes the larva are having the gills for exchange of the gases or for the respiration but when the larva is going to convert to the adult so adults are going to spend their life on land so that's why their gills are going to be replaced by the lungs for the gaseous exchange presence of the gills and the lungs varies among the species and by the developmental stages as we have discussed here uh, the gills are present in the larval stage and lungs are present in the adult stage forms with aquatic larva lose gills at the metamorphosis in frog the metamorphosis means meta means change and morph means shape when larva is going to change its shape and it's going to convert to an adult so at that time the gills are going to be replaced by the lungs many salamanders retain gills and an aquatic existence throughout the life so mostly salamanders retain the gills and spend their entire life in water now the thermoregulation so they are ectothermic ecto means outside and thermic means heat they are going to obtain heat from the external environment they are going to obtain heat by the conduction by the conduction processes from the external environment okay they are not endothermic they are not able to produce their metabolic heat so the body temperature is dependent upon the environmental temperature and they are not modulated by the metabolically generated heat means they are not endothermic some are nocturnal they are going to spend their life uh, or means they are going to perform their activities their feeding activities their reproductive activities at night and some are doing the evaporative cooling mechanism some are doing basking in the sun they are going uh, to obtain the sunlight from the environment so in this way they are uh, undergoing the process of thermoregulation now excretion so for the excretion their excretory system is uh, composed of the paired mesonephric or opisthonephric kidneys as you can see here the kidneys are associated with the ureter and ureter is leading to the bladder and bladder is leading to cloaca the main nitrogenous waste of the amphibians is urea but remember uh, for the larva because larva is going to spend its life in uh, water so its nitrogenous waste would be ammonia but for terrestrial amphibians the nitrogenous waste is urea 
hearing. So ear with tympanic membrane, the eardrum is present and stapes, eardrum is leading to stapes that is called the columella, okay, for transmitting vibrations to the inner ear. VN, for VN in ear, the cornea rather than lens is principal reflective surface for bending light. So there, as in case of the mammals, the lens is actually providing the reflective surface, but in case of the amphibians, the cornea is providing the reflective surface. The eyelids, the eyelids are present as well as the lacrimal glands. The lacrimal glands secretion will protect and wash the eyes of the amphibians. Mouth and jaws. Mouth uh, is usually large of the amphibians with the small teeth in the upper and both the lower jaws, okay? And they have paired internal nostrils. As you can see here in the diagram, the paired internal nostrils are leading to the nasal cavity. And uh, then uh, it's uh, connecting to the anterior part of the mouth cavity and enable breathing in lung breathing forms. Now the nervous system, so amphibians have 10 pairs of the cranial nerves, nerves that are uh, leading towards or away from the brain. Now reproduction and development. So and they are dioecious, their sexes are separate, separate male and female are present. So fertilization is mostly external in frogs and toads, the fertilization is in external, okay? These sperms are going to be released out in uh, water and uh, they're going to fertilize the eggs of the females. But uh, the fertilization is internal by the spermatophore in case of salamanders and sicilians. Okay. Predominantly, the amphibians are oviparous. They are egg-laying organisms. Some are ovoviviparous or some are viviparous. They are giving birth to the young ones. Now, metamorphosis, metamorphosis means shape change from larva to adult. Uh, so metamorphosis phenomena is present. As you can see here, the eggs, these are going to be fertilized. And then inside the eggs, the larva that is called the tadpole is going to develop. Then tadpole is going to be converted to the adult frog and adult frog is going to spend its life on terrestrial environment. The eggs of the amphibians are mesolecithal with the jelly-like membrane coverings. So we have done with the general characteristics of amphibians. Now our second point is the phylogenetic relationship or the evolutionary perspective of amphibians. So amphibians are tetrapods. They are having four uh, limbs. Tetrapods refer to the living amphibians, Thylis amphibia, okay? So the reptiles, birds, and the mammals. Amphibians arose from the ancient Sarcopterygians. Fossils of the early amphibians, Stegocephalia, are discovered in Greenland. I have quoted some diagrams of these organisms, these specimens, the Sarcopterygians, the Stegocephalia, okay, in the next diagram. So they are of 400 million year old group called like Thyostegalia. So amphibians um, evolved across, across almost 400 million years old uh, group uh, called the Ichthyostegalia or Ichthyostega. So you can see here in the diagram, they arose from the Sarcopterygians, Sarcopterygian ancestors. And uh, then it's leading to Ichthyostega. So from Ichthyostega, so you, you can see here the group Lace Amphibia. Uh, containing the different groups of amphibians, frogs and toads, salamanders and Sicilians are going to be uh, evolved. And it's about 400 million years ago. Now, the important characteristics evident in these fossils. These fossils means the characteristics uh, present in the ichthyostiga. Okay. And uh, now we're going to discuss about the characteristics that are... Uh, being modified in the recent amphibians. Like in case of the ichthyostiga, the cranial bones are present, but in uh, recent amphibians, the there is a loss of some cranial bones and appearance of mobile neck. So in case of ichthyostiga, the upper cooler bones are present, 
but in modern amphibians there is loss of the opercular bones similarly there is a reduction of notochord there is formation of more rigid vertebral column their four muscular limbs with discrete digits are present loss of fin days as you can see here the fin days are present in case of ichthyostega but in case of modern amphibians the fin rays are absent presence of a sacral vertebrae sacral vertebrae that is uh, going to fuse the vertebral column and the pelvic girdle these two portions the vertebrae fusing the vertebral column to the pelvic girdle is known as the sacral vertebrae and this sacral vertebrae is uh, actually uh, present in a case of modern amphibians now on the classification so modern amphibians belong to three orders the order caudata or urodella uh, means salamanders or newts order gymnophiona includes the cecilians order inura or salientia includes the frogs and toads so first of all i uh, will study about the order caudata or the urodella which includes salamanders okay this uh, second name is also very much important related to uh, your exams so the examples include the salamanders there uh, are about 550 species of salamanders mentioned in campbell biology now i have coded the different uh, number of species mentioned in different books like in campbell in hickman in miller and harley so that if uh, um, any sort of question you found in your exams related to the number of species so it, it would be easy for you to choose any one option if you have memorized the different number of the species of uh, salamanders mentioned in different books okay so 550 species of salamanders in campbell 553 species of salamanders in hickman 400 species of salamanders are found in the northern hemisphere in miller and harley 10th edition and 150 of the 350 species of salamanders are found in north america in miller and harley 5th edition so this is the difference of number of species the different number of species mentioned in different books so if you have just memorized this number so it would be easy for all of you to uh, identify or to select any one option now the characteristics of the uh, of the salamanders they have long tail as you can see in the diagram uh, they have two pairs of the limbs okay and uh, they lack middle ear salamanders lack middle ear salamanders range in length from few centimeter to 1.5 meter they spend most of their lives in water and frequently retain the caudal fins, okay? Most salamanders spend their entire life in water and they retain the caudal fin just like the fish. Now, salamanders in the family Plethodontidae are mostly terrestrial. They're going to spend their life on land. The salamanders belonging to family Salamandridae are called newts. It's very much important point related to the PPSC exam. Most salamanders have internal fertilization without copulation. Their eggs are deposited in singly, in clumps or in strings, okay? As you can see in the diagrams. Now, the larva is similar to adults, but smaller. As you can see here in the diagram, this one is the larva of salamander, but these are adult salamanders. So the larva is similar to adult by shape, but uh, it's smaller than the adult. Larva possess the features of the larva that are not present in the adults, include the external gills, tail fin, but in case of adults, the tail fin is absent, larval dentition and rudimentary tongue. So these are the specific features or unique features of the larva of the salamanders. Aquatic larval stage usually metamorphoses into a terrestrial adult, means the aquatic larva of the salamander is going to metamorphose, it's going to change its shape and will be converted to the terrestrial adult to spend its life on land. Now, many other salamanders undergo incomplete metamorphosis that is known as the pedomorph, okay, or pedomorphosis. So normally the egg mass is going to be converted to larva and from larva to adult. But sometimes 
the larva retains the uh, sexual characteristics the larva is uh, going to start the reproduction it uh, will retain the larval characteristics but it will be sexually mature so it will be called as pedomorph now pedomorphosis may be obligate means it's uh, and no it's necessary as in case of nectarus okay the common name of the nectarus is mud puppy or facultative as in case of ambystoma okay and it means it might uh, um, be necessary or might not be necessary in case of ambystoma whose common name is exolot metamorphosis is controlled by the anterior pituitary gland thyroid glands and the most important hormone of the thyroid gland is thyroxine that is actually playing a most important role in uh, metamorphosis now the second order is order gymnophiona or sicilians so sicilians uh, there are about 170 species mentioned in campbell 173 in hickman 116 miller and harley 10th and 5th editions now their characteristics they are elongated their body is worm like as you can see in the diagram and the the body is actually segmented and they are limbless they are having no limbs and their tail is pointed okay and this segmented by the annular grooves their body is segmented by the annular grooves their skin is going to cover the eyes as you can see here the skin is covering the eyes of sicilians Fertilization is usually internal and larval stages are passed within the oviduct. A retractile sensory tentacle is present between the eyes and the uh, nostrils. So between eyes and nostrils, uh, a sensory tentacle is present. Okay. Now the third order is order Anura or Salientia, uh, to which the frogs and toads belong. So I have quoted this life cycle of the uh, inurans here so that you can differentiate between the adult inurans and means adult frog and the larva of the frog. So there are five four two zero species of frogs mentioned in Campbell, five two eight three species of frogs and toads mentioned in Hickman, four thousand species mentioned in Miller and Harley tenth edition, and thirty five hundred species mentioned in Miller and Harley fifth edition. It's also very much important this the number of the species of frogs and toads mentioned in different books is also very much important. So their characteristics include now you'll have to uh, follow the diagram of the adult. These are tailless, okay. They have caudal vertebrae that is fused into a urostyle. They have elongated and muscular hind limbs with webbed feet. They have elongated and muscular hind limbs and their feet are webbed. Fertilization is external. As you can see in the diagram, the male is going to release its sperm during copulation and the sperms are going to fertilize the eggs externally in aquatic environment. Larvae are aquatic. Uh, inside the egg, inside the zygote, larva is going to develop and the larva is known as the tadpole. Tadpoles uh, are without limbs. As you can see here, tadpoles are having no limbs and they have well-developed Tails. The larva is herbivorous. It's going to feed on plants, but the adults are carnivores. Now, toads have dry and warty skin. As you can see in the diagram, two toads belong to the family Buffonidae. It's also a very much important point. Frogs have all uh, relatively smooth skin and prefer more aquatic habitats. True frogs belong to family Ranidae. Now we have done with the classification of amphibians and now we're moving towards the form and function of amphibians. So first point of form and function includes the skin of amphibians. So the amphibian skin is without scales. As you can see in the diagram, there are no scales. The skin of amphibians is smooth. Epidermal thickenings may produce warts and claws as uh, uh, in the diagram. It has been shown in the diagram. The secretions of the mucous gland keep the skin moist. All the amphibians possess the poisonous granular glands that uh, are uh, working for the defense of the amphibians. 
granular gland secretions include the neurotoxic myotoxic antibacterial and antifungal effects means uh, uh, it's these are these secretions are going to protect the amphibians from fungal attack bacterial attack okay from the neurotoxic chemicals <clears throat> chromatophores these are specialized cells in the skin that are responsible for the skin color and color change of the amphibians now support in amphibians so their skull is flattened and smaller skull of amphibians is flat and smaller the vertebral column is modified uh, to provide the support and flexibility on land amphibians have a neck cervical vertebrae the cervical vertebrae allows the head to node vertically sacral vertebrae these are the sacral vertebrae these anchor the pelvic girdle to the vertebral column the sternum sternum supports the four limbs and protects the internal organs as you can see here the modified xiphi sternum meso sternum joints allow the freedom of movement and better contact with the substrate pelvic girdle firmly attaches the pelvic appendages to the vertebral column now locomotion in amphibians so they are tetrapods they are having four limbs but some uh, species are limbless like the cecilians so terrestrial salamanders move by alternate movement of appendages as you can see here in the diagram cecilians have an accordion like movement like the snakes and the long hind limbs and the pelvic girdle of the a neurons are modified for jumping now the nutrition and the digestive system digestive parts of the amphibians include the mouth pharynx stomach small intestine large intestine cloaca and most adult amphibians are carnivores larva or herbivores okay so the buccal cavity or mouth leading to the pharynx leading to stomach to small to large intestine then to rectum and cloaca okay so this one is the digestive system the parts of the digestive system of the amphibians and the the larva is actually aquatic and it's going to feed on the plants but adults are going to spend their life on terrestrial environment they are carnivorous anurans means the frogs are using the flip and grab feeding mechanism the circulatory system circulatory system of amphibians is modified to accommodate the presence of lungs gas exchange at skin and loss of gills means the gaseous exchange will takes place in lungs across the skin and uh, through the gills amphibians have three chambered heart the atrium is partially divided in urodales and atrium is completely divided in a neurons in frogs but in salamanders like in urodales it's partially divided there is a single ventricle without septum okay now the blood flow so a spiral valve in the conus arteriosus or the ventral aorta directs blood into the pulmonary and the systemic circulations then in systemic circulation across the skin gaseous exchange will takes place and the oxygenated blood will return back to heart similarly through the pulmonary artery uh, the blood is moving towards the lungs and after being oxygenated the oxygenated blood is going to move back towards the heart gas exchange occurs across the skin of amphibians as well as lungs okay means the pulmonary and systemic circulation pulmonary circulation will carry blood to the lungs and systemic will carry blood to the skin and after being uh, oxygenated the oxygenated is, blood is going to move back towards the heart therefore the blood entering the right side of the heart is also well oxygenated after leaving the conus arteriosus the blood may enter uh, the carotid artery that takes blood to the head systemic artery that takes blood to body and pulmonary artery that takes blood to lungs now the gas exchange uh, in amphibians is carried out by three media by the skin that is cutaneous respiration by the lungs that is pulmonary respiration and by the gills so 
the gas exchange mechanism. Cutaneous aspiration means the gas exchange across the skin. Uh, carbon dioxide is going to diffuse out and oxygen is going to diffuse into the body. Skin is moist and richly supplied with the blood capillaries. Okay. Buccopharyngeal respiration uh, occurs across the moist surfaces of the mouth and the pharynx. Now, the mechanism of the gas exchange. Lungs of the salamanders are simple sacs. Lungs of A neurons are subdivided, increasing the surface area for gas exchange, as you can see here. Pulmonary ventilation occurs by a buccal pump mechanism. The buccal pump mechanism have two steps. The first one is inspiration and the second one is expiration. So first of all, we'll study about the inspiration. In case of inspiration, we'll fo follow the diagram A. The floor of the mouth is depressed, causing the air to be drawn into the buccal cavity through the nostrils. Okay, Through the open nostrils, uh, the lowered uh, floor of the buccal cavity through the open nostrils, air is going to move into the buccal cavity. Nostrils are then closed and the floor of the mouth is elevated. This creates a pressure that will force the air from buccal cavity to the lungs. Expiration is produced by the contraction of the muscles, as you can see here, by the contraction of the muscles of the body wall and the elastic recoil of the lungs. So it will lead to the uh, movement of gas out of the lungs and out of the body through the mouth. So these are the two steps, the inspiration and the expiration in case of gas exchange. Amphibians, larvae and some adults respire using the external gills that are spending their life in water. Excretion and osmoregulation. Excretory system of the paired mesonephric or opistonephric kidneys is present that is leading to the ureter, the urine bladder, and then to cloaca. Freshwater amphibians excrete ammonia. Amphibians that spend life on land excrete urea. Okay, so these two points are also very much important. Osmoregulation is a big problem for amphibians, means the balancing of the water and the solutes it is a problem for the amphibians, means um, they're going to spend their life, half-life in uh, uh, water and then half-life in uh, on land. In water, they must uh, get rid of excess water and conserve essential ions. These are the two phenomena. Now, what are their adaptations uh, to get rid of excess water and to conserve ions? The first one is the kidney is going to produce the hypotonic urine. Uh, the urine that is containing more water but less ions. So in this way, they will get rid of uh, excess water, but they will conserve the ions. Similarly, the skin of the uh, the skin and the walls of the urinary bladder they will absorb the sodium and the chloride ions and uh, will transport these ions back to blood. So in this way, they're going to conserve the essential ions in the body. Now, if they are spending their life on land, so they must need to conserve water. So the Two adaptations to conserve water on land includes they are going to limit themselves um, by reducing exposure to desiccating conditions, dry conditions. They will limit their exposure to dry conditions, and uh, they they are mostly nocturnal. They're spending uh, their activities, they're feeding, they grabbing at the time of night so that they can prevent the loss of water from their body. So during the daylight, they retreat to areas of high humidity. Diurnal amphibians that are going to spend their life in both day and the night time, they will prefer the areas of the high humidity. Most amphibians reduce the evaporative water loss by reducing the amount of the body exposed, surface exposed to air. Some amphibians have protective coverings like uh, the hard regions of the skin, like the warts and the cocoons to reduce the water loss. Now we're moving towards the nervous system. So the nervous system has three subdivisions, forebrain. Forebrain contains the olfactory center that regulates the color change and the visual functions. As you can see here in the diagram, the forebrain is having the olfactory center. Midbrain containing the optic tectum, the optic lobe that will assimilate the sensory information and initiates the motor response. 
and processes the visual sensory information. Hindbrain. Hindbrain functions in motor coordination and in regulating heart rate and respiration. This is also very much important point related to your exam. The function of the hindbrain is uh, uh, motor coordination and uh, regulation of the heart rate and respiration. Now, the sensory functions, sensory receptors are widely distributed over the skin of amphibians. The lateral line system is present in aquatic larva, but absent on uh, the adults. Chemoreceptors are present in nasal epithelium, in the lining of mouth, on the tongue. In nasal epithelium, they're going to uh, smell lining of mouth and on the tongue for um, the taste and over the skin for the touch. Olfaction is used in mate recognition as well as locating food. So olfaction means that the amphibians are going to use the smell for recognizing their mate as well as for locating their food. Their lower eyelid, the nictitating membrane is movable and it cleans and protects the eye. As you can see here in the diagram, this one is the lower eyelid or the nictitating membrane. The rods and the cones, these are the receptor cells. These are also present in the retina of the eye of the amphibians. So auditory system. Ear of a neuron consists of a tympanic membrane. This one is a tympanic membrane externally. This one is a tympanic membrane, a middle ear as well as inner ear. A abutting tympanic membrane is a middle ear ossicle called the stepes or columella, which transmits vibrations to inner ear. Now, the high frequency means uh, 1000 to 5000 hertz airborne vibrations are transmitted to inner ear through tympanic membrane, but the low frequency vibrations that are of 100 to 1000 hertz, these are transmitted to the four legs, then to pectoral girdle, then to inner ear through the upper column. Inner ear of the amphibians has the semicircular canals, as you can see here in the diagram, that help protect the rotational movement. Now the reproduction and development. So amphibians are dioecious. They have separate sexes, male and female. Fertilization is external in case of aneurons, as you can see here in the diagram, but internal in case of salamanders and sicilians. In aneurons, the development occurs in water. As you can see here in the diagram, in a neurons in frogs, the development is going to take place in water, the cleavage stages. In salamanders, eggs may be deposited in soil, in water, or they might be retained in oviduct. Most Sicilians have internal development. The larval stage of the amphibians or a neurons is known as the tadpole. Tadpole differ from the adults. Now we're going to study the differences. The tadpole. Uh, in the mode of uh, respiration. Tadpoles differ from adults in mode of respiration, means uh, in case of tadpoles, they're going to respire through the gills, but the adults are going to, are going to respire uh, through the lungs. Uh, form of locomotion, the tadpoles are going to uh, swim in water by the fins, by the tail, but the adults are going to hop or jump on land and diet. The tadpoles are going to feed on plants. They are herbivorous, but the adults are carnivorous. Now, viviparity and oviviparity occurs primarily in salamanders and sicilians. What is metamorphosis? The Shape change from larva to adult is actually known as metamorphosis. It's a series of abrupt structural, physiological, behavioral changes that will transform a larva or a tadpole into an adult. It is under the control of neurosecretions of the hypothalamus, hormones of the anterior pituitary and the thyroid gland. The most important hormone of the thyroid gland is thyroxine that is actually playing a role in the conversion of this tadpole to an adult. In the aneurons, the changes from the tadpole into the small frog, the changes include the, in case of the tadpole, uh, they, there are no limbs and there are uh, no lungs. But uh, when tadpole is going to convert it to the adult, the limbs and the lungs are going to develop 
tail is reabsorbed. We know that tadpole has tail, but uh, it's going to be reabsorbed when the metamorphosis phenomena will take place. So finally, the adults will have no tail. Skin thickens. Uh, the larva skin is smooth and soft, but the adult skin is thick. Marked changes in the head and the digestive system occurs. Now the pedomorphosis. Pedomorphosis is actually incomplete metamorphosis. Okay. So, pedomorphosis is actually incomplete metamorphosis. Usually the egg mass is going to convert to a larva and then larva is going to convert it to an adult. But sometimes the larva will retain the larval characteristics and it's going to be sexually mature. So this condition is known as the pedomorphosis. So sexual maturity while retaining the larval characteristics is known as pedomorphosis and it's taken place in salamanders. There are two reasons for pedomorphosis. Cells fail to respond to thyroid hormones or cells fail to respond uh, to the hormone production associated with the metamorphosis. So all the thing that matters a lot here is the accurate production of the hormones. If uh, there is not uh, accurate production of the hormones, so the metamorphosis will uh, not take place and it will lead to the pedomorphosis. Now the examples include the common mud puppy, Nectarus and the exolot embryostoma. These are the examples in which the pedomorphosis has taken place. Now we're going to discuss uh, some important MCQs. So number one is extinct amphibians are placed in the subclass Stegocephalia. Number two, metamorphosis is under the control of Tash. Select the false one. So metamorphosis is not under the control of the hormones of the neurohypophysis, means the hormones of the posterior gland of the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Exolot uh, number three, exolot is the name given to the larva of embryostoma. Number four, all of the following are amniotes except the one that is amphibian. Number five, salivary glands in frog are absent. Number six, the first well-known fossil of a tetrapod was in the genus Ichthyostega. Number seven, the kidneys of amphibians are described as mesonephric. Number eight, frogs and toads are in which phylum? In chordata. Remember, it's asking about the phylum, not the class. If uh, it's about the class, then we'll choose the amphibia. But here, the phylum has been mentioned, so that's why we have chosen chordata. Number nine, pigmented cells in the skin of amphibians are called chromatophores. Number 10, optic tectum is present in the midbrain. Number 11, salamanders are the members of the order caudata or urodella. Both of the options are correct. Number 12, Sicilians are the members of the order gymnophiona. Number 13, members of the order dash have caudal vertebrae fused into the urostyle. So that is in urine, frogs. Number 14, unlike the adults, in urine larva are herbivores, okay, and the adults are carnivores. Number 15, common name of the nectarus is mud puppy. Number 16, amphibians evolved from the sarcopetergian fish ancestors. Number 17, the retention of the larval characteristics seen in salamanders is known as pedomorphosis, that is incomplete metamorphosis. Number 18, salamanders lack all of these, the outer ear, the tympanum, or the middle ear. Number 19, hibernating frog respires through the skin. Number 20, amphibian skin has which of the following structure? Uh, amphibian skin have glands, not the hairs, feathers, or scales. Now we have some PPSC zoology past paper MCQs. So the first one is, the retention of the larval forms and structure in adults is known as pedomorphosis. And this question is from PPS zoology paper 2015. Number two, the hormone responsible for the amphibian metamorphosis is thyroxine. And this question is also from PPSC zoology 2015 paper. Number three, urinary bladder in amphibians is the ventral growth of cloaca. And this question is from PPSC zoology 2017 paper. Number four, 
Amphibians without tail belongs to the order Anura, and this question is from PPSC Zoology 2020. Number five, which of the following has the maximum of the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in the ventricle of its heart? So this is frog actually. And this question is from PPSC Zoology paper 2002. Number six, frog has the following number of the neck vertebrae. Uh, the frog has nine neck vertebrae and this question is from PPSC Zoology paper 2003. Number seven, amphibians have the following number of chambers in their heart. So there are three chambers, two atria and one ventricle. And this question is from PPSC paper 2004. Number eight, the number of ribs in frog are, there are no ribs in frog actually. And this question is from PPSC Zoology paper 2005 as well as 2006. Number nine, red blood cells in amphibians are nucleated. And this question is from PPSC Zoology paper 2006. Number 10, sternum is absent in amphibians. Okay. And this question is from PPSC Zoology paper 2009. So we have uh, done with uh, the general characteristics, classification, form, and function, as well as the important questions and the PPSC Zoology past paper questions of the amphibians. This topic has been completely covered for you guys for the preparation of different competitive exams. Um, we'll come up with the next video, inshallah, on fishes. Until then, Allah Hafiz.